Hey folks, in this video I'm going to be analyzing another game submitted via our Patreon page. And in this game we're actually going to see both players making certain mistakes when it comes to the pawn structure. And it'll give us a chance to talk about how to make decisions uh, as it relates to the structure on the board. So this was a classical game submitted by PDC56, uh, who offered some notes uh, playing black here. The time control I believe was a 60 plus 30, and this was played uh, on chess.com. So we're seeing online uh, chess.com classical ratings here. So in the game we get e4, e6, d, uh, the French defense, d4, d5. White decides to take the exchange French, e takes d5, knight f3, and your black plays c5. And PDC writes that they usually play c5 in the advanced variation, uh, so this is why they played here, but this is a pretty typical mistake. This is a different position. We, this is not the advanced variation of the French. <laughs> it, is, it is already a different structure, and you have to be very careful before making moves like this because c5 offers to open up the position, and you have to be very careful when doing this as black because black is uh, starts the game behind in development. If you open things up too early, that's going to be a problem. Of course, the big difference in the advanced variation is that white closes the center, and here indeed c5 is a very important move for black in order to put pressure on white's big space advantage. So after takes takes knight f3 and c5, um, this one is very risky, not to mention because once these pawns get traded off, black is going to be left with an isolated pawn in the center, and that's generally considered a very risky pawn to have because it cannot be defended with other pawns, it has to be defended with pieces, and that often leaves one in a passive situation. So from white's point of view, the main way to take advantage of an early c5 uh, in the French is to start with this move bishop to b5 check. This is mainly just to accelerate development. And here white actually doesn't even mind a trade of light squared bishops because eventually what's going to happen after the trade, let's say knight takes d7, white can castle first or take on c5. But the point is, is that white is going to take on c5 at some point, leaving black with an isolated pawn on d5 and white is very happy to start trading off minor pieces when it comes to fighting against uh, this pawn. So for example, bishop d6, white can uh, play like knight c3 here, or take on c5, and then go knight c3, and this pawn is going to be weak, the rest of white's pieces develop quickly, and yeah, white has a very, very pleasant game here, because a pawn on d5 is just long-term weakness. So this is kind of the main way to take advantage. After knight c6, it's very, very similar, white can just castle here, wait for black to move the bishop with something like bishop d6, then eventually take on c5 and play against the isolated queen pawn. And I think white just gets uh, a really great position here. Instead in the game, we see knight to c3. So white doesn't go for, uh, let's say the most aggressive option with bishop to b5. And here black continues with knight to c6, giving white another option to play bishop to b5, kind of transposing to the previous lines we were looking at, and I think white's position here is again uh, quite good. Instead, what black should have done, and both players kind of missed this opportunity, black actually should have taken this chance to close the position with the move c4. And this one does a couple of things. Number one, it stops white from being able to take on c5, meaning black's pawn on d5. Uh, is not nearly as weak and can be easily defended here. Number two, it also restricts white's light square bishop and takes away one of the best squares for the bishop in these kinds of positions, which is the d3 square. Uh, obviously, it also blocks off the b5 square and enforces the bishop to have to go somewhere passive like e2. Now, this move c4 is not normally a move that you want to play in the French. You have to be really, really precise about when you play it. For example, going back to that advanced variation after c5, c3, it would be a real strategic mistake here, a blunder actually to play c4, because black would be losing all of their potential pressure on the center. Now this move can be played later on, but only once the game has progressed. Maybe white has pushed the a pawn and weakened uh, the b3 square, then this move c4 can start to make more sense. But here, once we get, let's say, a little bit more open position, Black really wants to avoid the structure, in my opinion, where you get the isolated queen pawn. So here, c4, I think, makes a lot of sense. And the key difference here, of course, is that Black's bishop is not blocked in. The bishop can, of course, get developed here very easily. And so Black isn't paying such a hefty price for keeping the position closed. So this was the move I think both players kind of underestimated. This would have been a very important move here. Um, Black plays knight c6, again, allowing white to kind of... Uh, keep the initiative with bishop to b5. Instead, white plays bishop to e3, 
Understandable move, white is strengthening the center, but giving black another chance to play c4, after which I think black's position would be totally okay. Black has a little bit more space on the queen side, all the pieces can be developed naturally, uh, and there are some options here as well, black and castle, and yeah, again, has a totally fine position. Instead, we see the move knight g7. And yeah, this one I think is just a straight up blunder. Black just forgets about this pawn in general, and white just takes finally and wins the pawn. Uh, and now white just gets a completely winning position, and the next couple moves really, I think, just develop in white's favor. Uh, black plays knight f5, allowing white to take a second pawn, but then after knight takes e3, black will be at least winning one pawn back with bishop takes c5. So knight takes e3 is played, bishop takes c5. White is still uh, up one pawn, but at least black has the bishop pair. White goes for the queen side with takes, knight takes d8, and white castles queen side. Now I think a quick uh, moment here, definitely it made to me more sense to first throw in bishop to b5 check from white's point of view in this position, because here either black is forced to move their king or they have to play bishop to d7, uh, and then they're forced to move their king anyway, and white can even castle with tempo. I think this would be giving white an even bigger advantage than what we see in the game. Or if black plays something like knight to c6, then this is somewhat of an awkward pin. White can consider moves like knight to e5 or just castling and continuing uh, the pressure here. Um, instead, we see uh, queenside castling, and black here decides to uh, castle kingside, bishop c4, bishop e6, uh, white trades on e6, knight takes e6, and plays the move rook to d5. And it feels like white encourages this trade of bishop takes e3, f takes e3, and black does go ahead and take this one uh, on e3. And for me, I don't know, I think this wasn't really necessary for white to allow. I don't think it makes a huge difference here, but it does feel like a concession that white has to isolate one of their pawns and now has a weakness on the e-file. So to my eyes, a more natural move would be something like rook he1, just preparing to recapture with the rook and keeping a very healthy extra pawn. Uh, but I don't think it makes a huge difference, but okay, white goes rook d5, black takes on e3, f takes e3. And here I think maybe black makes uh, one of the more instructive mistakes of the game, rook a d8. Feels like a very natural move, but we have to remember we're pawned down at this point, so trading and any kind of simplification generally going to be in white's favor, the side with extra material. So what we see here is black willingly trading off all the rooks, and this actually makes things a lot easier for white. When you're the side that's down material, you really want to be keeping pieces on the board, especially heavy pieces like rooks and queens, as these can do a lot of damage, and they can really turn the tide if you can get the initiative. So big mistake here, trading off the rooks, I think something like rook fe8, and yeah, white is a pawn up, white has a huge advantage here, but it's still going to have to work to convert this. And that's how we want to make it. We want to force the stronger side to really prove their advantage, force them to convert it, and to force simpl simplifications, trading pieces off the board, and only then they can win. We don't really want to make it easier um, for them by offering the trades ourselves. So definitely black should have just kept the rooks um, away from white's rooks, just keeping them on uh, active files, and then it would be quite hard for white to make progress in the long run. So rook d8, we end up trading off all the rooks, and now things are much easier for white. The king can come in without feeling any danger whatsoever, and white is just a pawn up. So things actually end up getting a little bit worse here for black. Knight b7, knight d4, with an unfortunate double attack. Uh, f5 pawn is hanging, as well as the threat of knight c6 and taking on a7. So black plays a6, white ends up winning the second pawn, king f6, knight d4, and uh, king e5. So now white is up two pawns, and from here actually white starts making really dramatic uh, mistakes. Possibly because white felt like they were completely winning up two pawns. I'm not really sure, but this is something that typically happens to someone when they're ahead. They uh, sometimes can relax and then not play their best chess. So in this position, um, Daster here plays b5, which is... Uh, yeah, I would say another strategic uh, mistake, this time from, from White's point of view. Because after a5, what White has done is just totally conceded the c5 square for Black's knight. And all of a sudden, White's queenside majority here is absolutely meaningless because these pawns are just fully blockaded. Not to mention the fact that the knight on c5 is going to be taking the pawn on a4, which is now just a fixed weakness. So, yeah, real strategic lemon here with b5 just giving up 
uh, a square, uh, a huge square to, to Black's Knight. Um, White had many different options here, and as long as Black's Knight and King don't get any real activity, White is just two pawns up and can slowly advance and win the game. A simple plan would have been something like Knight to b3, uh, followed by pushing c5 or a5 and just getting the queen side pawns going. White can also think about pushing e4 in the near future. Um, a fancy way to do it would be to just play a5 right away, with the point that if Black takes this one, White can play Knight c6 check and then take on a5 and... Of course, black can never trade knights here, as white is just up two pawns, and is going to be up two pawns in the king and pawn endgame. Uh, as a general rule, uh, knight endgames can be evaluated similarly to king and pawn endgames. You just imagine that the knights were traded off, and that's kind of the evaluation for the knight endgame as well. And yeah, with two extra pawns, um, it's hard to imagine that black can uh, survive here. But after b5, a5, the position has uh, completely shifted, and white is temporarily up two pawns, but that's just not going to last for very long. Um, so knight c6 check is played, king d6, king c3, knight c5, and white just can't defend the a4 pawn. White played knight d4, black takes this one, knight c5 check, and now white is forced to put the king on the a3 square in order to deal with black's a5 pawn. And even though white is still up a pawn here, the position is actually very, very unclear, and if anything, it's black who is better, uh, because white's king is totally sidelined, this a5 pawn is a protected passer and super strong, and black's king is of course much more active here and can start to go after white's pawns. Uh, so knight d3 is played, knight f5 check, king c5, and the game here gets super sharp, but it's actually black that ends up getting the upper hand uh, after h4, king to c4. Black's king is just that much more active, and the pawns on the queen side are just stronger and faster than white's kingside counterplay. So h5 is played, uh, b5, g5, b4 check, king a4, black pushes b3. It was much stronger to first throw in knight c5 check, forcing white's king up the, uh, up the board even further, and then pushing b3, and then this pawn would have been pretty much unstoppable. Um, instead, black pushed b3, giving white one final chance, actually, that he uh, unfortunately missed after knight f5, b2, white goes knight d6 check, and uh, here actually, surprisingly, the knight is actually in time to stop the pawn, because based on whenever wherever black's king goes, there's going to be a check and a possible fork. So for example, king d5, knight b5, and black can't promote without allowing knight to uh, c3. Now black can make a knight, but then the game is still very, very complicated, as black just doesn't have very many pawns. White can take on a5, and then is going to be able to trade this one off um, as well. So king c3 is played. If king c5, then there's knight e4 check, and the knight can uh, try to come back this way. Um, but after king c3, white unfortunately blunders here with knight e4. Or after king c2, there's suddenly no more checks and no more way for white to uh, stop the b-pawn. Uh, of course, white had to play knight b5 check and then bring the knight to a3. And then things are actually uh, pretty unclear still. Uh, still, King d2, knight a3. It's going to be very difficult for black to promote the pawn um, without allowing white to just sack the knight for it. But of course, now the material is very reduced. Yeah, so after king c1, let's say king takes a5. If black promotes here, white can just give the knight for uh, black's pawn. Uh, and then black is just left with this one pawn, and white can just immediately play g6 here and trade it off. And in fact, black <laughs> needs to make sure that uh, their knight is actually stopping uh, the pawn, which I think it is after um, after takes, takes let's say, knight e5, black has check, and knight e7. Okay, white can also try uh, h6 here, and then this might be pretty pretty dangerous for black. So yeah, if anything, black needs to be careful here and not allow white's pawns to promote. Um, and so, yeah, after this one, I think the most likely result of the game probably would be something like a draw. Black could play like knight e5, and yeah, neither side, I think, should be able to win. Um, so yeah, knight e4 ends up being the game losing move after king c2. Black ends up promoting here, and yeah, white is simply not in time uh, with the counterplay as black promotes, has a mate threat, and yeah, the queen was just, of course, uh, too strong here. So really uh, shocking finish, you know, big, big upset, but it does show you, like, even in the end game, you know, two pawns up, nine end game seems like it should be completely over. One strategic mistake can actually just completely uh, turn things around. After this move, b5, all of a sudden, you know, black took over the initiative and ends up winning uh, 
winning the night end game two pawns down. Uh, super, super surprising, but it, it does happen and it shows the importance of paying attention to the structure, paying attention to the opponent's pieces, and trying not to uh, create weaknesses in your own camp. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for this video. Hopefully you found it useful. Uh, if you did, please uh, leave a thumbs up on it and make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. All right, hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll catch you next time. Take care.